Shalom, shalom, my brother and sister. I trust you and your family are good and having a great week. And uh, we'll be continuing with our series on spiritual preparedness. Today is part three, so thank you for joining me uh, on this journey that the Father has been taking me on as well. So as we start with this message today, I want you to open your Bible so long at 2 Samuel 9. 2 Samuel 9. And we will be reading from verse 1 to 8, but that's a bit later on. 2 Samuel 9, verse 1 to 8, a bit later on. So we started talking last week about fellowship and how it is good to press in to the Father's presence. It's good to be in the Father's presence. It's, it's amazing to, uh, to have the Father part of your life. But we started seeing that there's a difference between presence and intimacy. And ultimately, Father is calling you and me to intimacy. To sit at His table, to be panim al panim, face to face with Him. You know, sooner or later, we should get to a point where, where yes, like I said, we want to dwell with the Father, but we want to be in relationship with Him. You see, it's not just about hearing what other people say about our King and Messiah. It's not just to see how He moves. It's not just to walk into a place and you feel the anointing and you feel the presence of the Ruach there. It is to be actually in relationship with Him, to, to, to have fellowship with Him, to be intimate with the Father. I want to make it clear today that don't tell me you have a relationship with Abba Yahuwah, but you're more intimate with the world and with matters of the world and what's going on with the world. Don't tell me you're longing for the presence of the Father, but you seek for the acceptance of man. You see, my brother and sister, when you and I, when we in this relationship, this intimate, loving relationship, then we don't long for the acceptance of people. When I met my wife and, and I fell in love with her, I stopped longing for the acceptance of other women and looking at other women. And that is what Father wants to teach you and me about fellowship. When you and I say that we are in relationship with our King Messiah, Yeshua, then we don't long for the acceptance of man. Then I no longer want to sit in front of the church. Then I no longer want to do things just to be seen. Then I no longer follow the pastor um, and just follow whatever word he has because I'm in intimacy, relationship with my Heavenly Father. It's more important to me what he's got to say. It's more important to me what, what, what He wants me to do. Where He wants me to be at. That is the relationship with the King. That is intimacy with Him. We read 1 Corinthians 10 verse 21. You are not able to drink the cup of the Master and the cup of demons. You are not able to partake of the table of the Master and the table of the demons. You see, drinking the cup means that we deny our own will and we yield to the Father's will. To drink His cup means we no longer seek for the acceptance of men. We no longer uh, uh, got this burning desire to be in the presence of men, but we want to be in the presence of the King Himself. So are we able to seek the Father? Do we know that we are His sons and daughters? If a man wants to be near the Father, if we want to receive His glory, we have to obey His will. We have to be intimate with Him. You know, we grow up as children in our homes. And I want you to think back, my brother and sister, when you were a small girl, a young boy, we grow up as children in our homes where our parents do stuff a certain way. They talk a certain way. They, they have maybe a way they love. And sooner or later, you and I start to conform to all of this. 
Then we grow up and our school teachers, they, they start teaching us new things and we start conforming to their ideas and their opinions. Then we start to work and we then conform to our employers' ideas and opinions. By the end of the day, after many, many years, you and I, we have kids of ourselves and then we start to impose our opinions on them so they start to conform to our ideas and opinions again. And now, and now we're going to start seeing that the Father asks you and me, He says, my son and my daughter, I want you to conform to me. Stop seeking the acceptance and the belonging of this world and to men. Conform to me. Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 says, I call upon you therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Allah, to present your bodies a living offer, in other words, for Him, a living sacrifice for the Father, not conforming to men. He says, set apart while pleasing to Allah. Your necessary, or, sorry, your reasonable worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well pleasing and perfect desire of a lure. What is the perfect desire of a lure? In other words, Verse 2 says, do we worship our Creator with our body, mind, and soul? Because then we will not conform to this world. But we will then conform to Him. And as we learn, we find out what Abba Yahuwah wants from you and me. And then we learn what He wants, and then we start to see, but it's actually different to the world. You see, that's a choice you and I need to make in this spiritual warfare that we're in and this spiritual preparedness that we are, we are in. Are we going to conform to the world? Are we going to conform to the Father? And that is where I want to start with this tonight, today. Are we conforming to the Father? I always tell people who want to argue about the Bible, about what it says or doesn't say, or what about they believe or not believe, to what they think is truth or what they don't think is truth, that we first need to establish who is the God we are talking about. That is very important. In other words, if I like my sin, then I will always take offense with anything the Bible has to say about sin. Then I will always find a loophole so that the word of Yahuwah will suit me. You know, am I going to serve him the way he wants or the way some other worldly God tells me to serve him? Do I rule over myself? Do I decide for myself? Do I believe what I want to believe? Or maybe is the God I'm serving not perhaps other faiths God's? Am I sure the way I'm serving Abba Yahuwah is not the way Buddha is being served? Or Hare Krishna? Or what other, any other faith or God out there? Am I serving Abba Yahuwah the way He prescribes, the way He instructs, the way He has called you and me to serve Him? Are we conforming to that, to His ways? I want to say this. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Yes, we might believe in Abba Yahuwah. But some of us don't serve Him the way He instructs us. So what do I mean by that? Yes, I can believe that King Yahushua is my Savior. I believe He died on the cross and He rose from the dead on, uh, on the third day. I believe he is in control of the universe and that he sits on the throne. But listen, do I serve him or follow him as his store or his instructions tells me to? You see, my brother and sister, there's a big difference between believing and serving. 
I'm going to say this again and listen to me. There's a big difference between believing and serving. And here's the punchline. As a believer, without righteous works, my faith is dead. And that is servanthood. That is servanthood. If I believe Messiah Yahushua and I walk according to His pathways, then I will work my faith as He describes us to do, as He tells us to do. With every verse and every idea that we've been discussing for the past few, few weeks, it's all about the heart of the Father. It's all about spiritual preparedness. So as we go a bit deeper with spiritual preparedness this week, let's allow Abba to come and show us his heart. And as we start today, then we'll see this is what David did. David conformed to the heart of Abba Yahuwah. So may we conform to the Father's heart and will as well. We read in Acts 13 verse 22, and having removed him, he raised up, having removed Saul, King Saul, he raised up for them David as a sovereign to whom also he gave witness and said, I have found David, the son of Yeshai, a man after my own heart, who shall do all my desires. Can we see what is written here? What did our Yahuwah see in David? He saw a heart that would seek to desire to, um, this desire to follow the Father's instructions. To please the Father. That is it. You see, it's one thing to believe in Messiah, but it's a completely different thing to do His will. My brother and sister, that is spiritual preparedness. To know Messiah, Yusha, so well that we walk the walk like he did. We talk the talk like he did. And nothing different. To follow the Father. To, to know what the Father desires. Yeshua says, if you love me, then you'll keep my instructions. We must understand that the instructions Yeshua talks about is not just the commandments. It's not just what is right and what is wrong. Yeshua is talking about listening when he speaks. Do the Father's will in all things. We read in Matthew 26, 39. And going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I desire, but as you desire. You see, intimacy with Abba Yahuwah is doing what He desires. Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane complied to the Father's will. He conformed to the Father's desires. John 14, 31. But in order for the world to know that I love the Father, that as the Father commanded me, so I'm doing. As the Father commanded me, so I'm doing because Yeshua loved his Father. We read in John 6, 38, Because I have come down out of the heavens, not to do my own desires, but the desires of Him who sent me. So what is Messiah saying here? He's saying, I will follow the heart of my Father. You see, if the heart of David equaled the heart of the Father, then that is obedience. David did the Father's, whatever the Father desired. Whenever we study the Psalms, we see the heart of David as a repentant heart, a humble heart, a faithful heart, a devoted heart, a loyal and obedient heart. And just as important, a heart that seeked the Father above all. 
Are we seeking the desires of the Father, my brother and sister? For you and me to be spiritually ready, are we seeking the desires of the Father? You see, because David recognized his strength in Abba Yahuwah. David recognized the favor he would receive will only be through the Father. So we will today start to learn the Father's heart when we see how David reacts and he uh, interacts with Mephibosheth. We're going to read that verses now, but we'll start to see how David was, again, I'm not saying he was perfect. I'm not saying compare yourself to David, but David had this heart of the Father. And I'm asking you, my brother and sister, I'm talking to myself today. We must search out our hearts to see whether we measure up to the Father's desires. Are we measuring up to the Father's heart? Because we will see that everything David did, everything that David spoke to Mephibosheth about, is the desires of the Father and is the same that the Father wants from you and me today. So what sets David apart? What did Abba see in him? And what does Abba want to teach you and me in this spiritual preparedness? To be spiritually fit. fit. Do we sometimes sit with a spiritual identity crisis, my brother and sister? Because we don't know um, whose we are. You see, as we start to get spiritually fit and ready to face the stress and persecution, only then will we be anchored in Messiah Yahushua because we know who we are. If I'm in relationship with Him, if I'm intimate with my bridegroom, then I know who I am. So I want to invite you on a journey. On a journey where Father wants you and He calls you and me, my brother and sister, to go and to come and sit by His table. To be fed by Him. To be face to face with Him. To talk to Him. To hear His opinion. So let's read 2 Samuel 9 verse 1 to 8. And David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Shaul that I might show him loving commitment because of Jonathan? And the house of Shaul had a servant whose name was Tziba. And they had called him to David, and the sovereign said to him, Are you Tziba? And he said, Your servant. And the sovereign said, Is there not still someone of the house of Shaul, so that I show him the loving commitment of Elua? And Tziba said to the sovereign, There is still a son of Jonathan, lame in his feet. So the sovereign said to him, Where is he? And Tziba said to the sovereign, See, he is in the house of Makir, son of Amil, in Lodebar. And sovereign David sent and brought him out of the house of Makir, son of Amil, from Lodebar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Shaul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. David said to him, listen to this, my brother and sister, listen to what David says here. He says, one, do not fear. For I shall certainly show you loving commitment. That's grace. Because of Jonathan, your father, and I shall return to you the land of Shaul, your grandfather, and let you eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should turn to such a dead dog as I? 
for amazing promises, for amazing words spoken by David here. And it's important for you and me, my brothers and sisters, in the spiritual walk that we in, in the spiritual preparedness, this readiness that you are, are that you and I are in. It is important for us to understand this. Do not fear. It's important for us to understand that the Father will show grace, loving commitment towards you and me. That He'll restore back to us something. And we're going to find out what that is. And then He says, you'll eat bread, manna at my table continually. It's important for us to understand these four things, my brother and sister. So let's understand the context of what precedes these acts of David. Why did King David wanted to show favor towards Mephibosheth? You see, many, many years ago, David was fleeing from King Saul, who wanted him dead because of all the victories David had, had over the enemies, and, he, and he's grown more popular than what the King Saul did. So Saul believed the lie from the enemy that David wanted his kingdom. So let's just stop here for a minute. Let's just stop here. How many times, my brother and sister, do we believe the lies from the enemy just like King Saul? You see, when we believe his lies, then we conform to his lies. When we believe the, the truth and the promises of the Father, then we stand on that. So that means we conform to that. When we believe the lies of the enemy, we stand on those lies. So we conform to those lies. When we listen to his lies, then we become just like him. Do you know why? Because we do not stand in the truth of the Father. Because we do not stand in the fellowship and intimacy with Messiah Yeshua. That is why. When I fellowship with Messiah, when I'm intimate, then I know who my bridegroom is. I know who my king is because I sit at his table. I know I'm his bride. And yes, then I know whose I am. Therefore, I can stand and I can face adversity. Then I can stand and the enemy can come with his lies, but I'll be standing on the truth of Messiah. I'll be anchored in my bridegroom. Only the truth of Messiah, who shall set us free. Only when I'm anchored in the truth of Messiah, which I can I use the word as a sword to defend myself from the lies of the enemy. Do we know who we are? Are we conformed to the enemy and his fear? Are we conformed to the enemy and his lies? Or are we conforming to the Father and his truth and his life? So David was running and hiding all over. And then one day he confronts Jonathan. And we know they were big friends. I mean, they, they were brothers, spiritual brothers. And so David's asking, why is your father wanting to kill me? So Jonathan said, okay, you'll approach his father directly and, 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 he, and he'll ask his father on David's behalf. And, but then he also said that he'll give David a sign. If it's true that his father wants to kill him, he'll give a sign so that David can flee. But then Jonathan and David saw an allegiance to each other as well. And in return, John, Jonathan asks, for mercy from David over himself and over his household. And that, my brother and sister, you can read 1 Samuel 20, verse 14 to 15, and 1 Samuel 23, verse 17 to 18. So that is why David asked about Mephibosheth, because he's honoring his word. If you have to ask me today, Francois, what according to you was David's greatest battles or acts? then yes, I'll have to say firstly, the day he faced Goliath. You see, and we so many times talk about his victory over Goliath, but we, we hardly ever talk about that spiritual fight, that spiritual preparedness, the spiritual fitness David had. 
His victory over Goliath is only possible because David spent time with the Father. David knew who he was in the Father. David knew the truth of the Father. You see, David was spiritually fit. David has been spiritually prepared for this day. He knows the Father. He had a relationship with Abba Yahuwah. Therefore, he could face the stress. Therefore, he could stand in front of Goliath. Therefore, he could be on the run and he could hide in the mountains because he knew the promises of the Father. You see, the victory over Goliath was only possible because spiritually, David was ready and fit. I'm going to say this again. The victory over Goliath was only possible because spiritually David was ready and fit. And that's the way it should be in our lives, my brother and sister. So every week so far I've been asking the question, are we spiritually prepared and ready? Are we fit? The second biggest victory or act, if you want to call it, that I want to talk to you about today, in my opinion, was when David honored his promises to Jonathan. You see, here is David, the king of Israel. He humbled himself as the king to show grace and mercy towards an enemy, a so-called enemy. To show grace and mercy towards Mephibosheth because of a promise. He showed grace and mercy towards the less fortunate. And in this, David showed the heart of the Father. You see, because we, my brother and sister, you and I, that we do not deserve the grace and the mercy from our King Yahushua, but we received it. He humbled himself. He left his throne to come to earth to show grace and mercy towards you and me. You see, Abba Yahuwah, listen, Abba Yahuwah honored his promise he made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. David honored the promise he made to Jonathan. Can we see this picture today? That, my brother and sister, is the heart of the Father. To show love when it's not asked. To give grace and mercy when it's, when it's needed. Doesn't matter who that person is. Doesn't matter what that person said or did. You see, David is probably most known for defeating the giant Goliath, isn't it? That is the story we all know. But we simply forget or maybe don't get taught about this act that he did. What about after David was anointed as king, as the next king of Israel? You see, he didn't just become the king. He stayed on as his father's shepherd for many years. He kept on looking after the herds and the sheep. I want you to see this picture today of David being a, a young man and now he gets anointed as king. But Yahuwah says, my son David, I've chosen you to lead my people to be a shepherd. But first, my son, I'm going to put you through my school so that you can learn to trust me. So that you can learn to rely on me and keep your eyes on me. Because spiritually, you need to be prepared, my son David. You need to be spiritually fit for what is coming in the future. You see, David, because I know the end from the beginning. David, my son, because I know what's going to happen in your future. Therefore, my son, you need to be prepared and fit. So that you can stand. You see, my brothers and sisters, are we conforming to the heart and the desires of the Father? He wants you and me spiritually fit. He wants you and me spiritually ready and prepared. Are we? We need to start to learn to become spiritually fit. We need to be equipped to face our giants and not always run away or to close our eyes and hope it goes away. 
or to start praying and hoping it goes away. No, we must face our Goliath. We must stand in the truth of our King Yahushua. We must stand in His promises. Therefore, we need to be in a state of readiness. Therefore, my brother and sister, you and I, we need to be spiritually fit. So David goes back to shepherding his father's flocks, defending them against predators. Father teaches him patience on how to worship through good and bad times. And then finally, you see, then David had to write a test. And his test was Goliath. Are we that spiritually ready and fit, my brother and sister? Can we face our giants? Can we face our Goliath and know that we will walk away victorious? You see, when Father anoints us or calls us for whatever we must do for His kingdom, He then starts to equip us. And that equipping, my brother and sister, might take several years. It's definitely not an overnight thing. It might not always be easy or be nice. I want to ask you today, stay humble, continue learning, stay in the Father, Abba Yahuwah, and know that He knows best. And know that He knows when you'll be ready because He knows the end from the beginning. When you're ready, my brother and sister, He'll send you out to go and face your giant. When you are spiritually ready and fit. I'm sure we all know that feeling. Maybe you've been called for this ministry or for whatever other ministry. Maybe you've been called as a counselor or whatever, my brother and sister. But it seems like it's never going to happen. It seems like, uh, I don't know, there's always something coming up and something stopping you. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's still something that needs to fall in place. I want you to consider this today. Maybe it's Abba Yahuwah still preparing you. Maybe it's the Father still keeping you back so that He can equip you. You see, that's why we need to be in relationship and fellowship with Him. To sit at His table when He says, My son, my daughter, you are ready. Go. You see, not just to do things out of our own um, selfish need, but to do and to go when He sends us because then we would have been healed if we needed to be healed. Then we would have been restored if we needed to be restored. Then we would be ready and spiritually fit for whatever lies ahead. And again, it will not always be easy. But we should stand on the rock of ages. We should look upon the Father with dove's eyes focused in on Him and not circumstances, not this ministry that I want. You see, then only I'll be ready and fit for His purpose. By us serving the Father, it does not always mean smooth sailing. Because even when David defeated Goliath, listen, even when David defeated Goliath, he had to run for his life. And again, like we've just said, for many years, for many years to come, David had to run. He faced a lot of difficulties. But he had to stay spiritually ready and fit for when his time would come to take over the leadership of Israel. He had to be ready and fit, my brothers and sisters. Therefore, you and I, doesn't matter what happens in our lives, we need to stay in fellowship with the King. We need to stay in fellowship with Abba Yahuwah. If there's three attributes or characteristics that I, that I would like to highlight today for us to understand why David did what he did in the verses we read about Mephibosheth. Firstly, it's because he had a shepherd's heart. A heart that protected his father Jesse's sheep from bears and lions. A heart that looked after his father's property. A man that stood up for the right 
and the life of the innocent. A man that did what was right to the helpless. A man that was prepared to give his life for others. In other words, he stood up for the father when he faced Goliath. He stood up for the glory and the honor of the father. Is that what you and I do? Do we stand up? And call someone out when they are interpreting the Father's words wrong. Are we standing up when someone is not walking according to the Father's desires even though they say they do? Do we openly proclaim the Father's name and His kingdom purposes? Secondly, David had a heart of worship. Yes, he played the harp. The Bible describes David playing his harp that when he plays, demons fled. 1 Samuel 16, 23. A man in a king that was not ashamed or too proud to praise and worship the king of kings. When we study the Psalms, then we see even in the most difficult times, David worshipped. A man that knew no problem was too big or too small to worship and to sing about, to praise the Father about. Therefore, I want to ask you today, do you have a song that you sing for your king, my brother and sister? How often do you sing that song for him? Thirdly, David had a warrior heart. He led his men into battle, and yes, his men fought for him as well. But listen to this, David led his kingdom into worship for Abba Yahuwah. How many times have we read how David danced? Do you have a warrior heart for him? Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 we read, For the eyes of Yahuwah diligently search throughout all the earth to show himself to be strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect to him. This perfect does not mean sinless. It means perfect. That perfect means to be focused on the Father. To have a heart for the Father. In just these three characteristics, David's heart, we start to see the Father's heart. So when we've read 2 Samuel 9 and, we, and we're going to go deeper in this, we see the Father's heart. David showed the kindness and grace of the Father. The same grace and kindness the Father showed towards him all those years when he had to run, David showed toward Mephibosheth. David kept his promises just like Abba kept his promises. David gave life to Mephibosheth just like Father gave him life. So before we go deeper into the promises, David made to Mephibosheth and how it represents our relationship with our King Yahushua. Let's get to know Mephibosheth first. We read in verse 1 to Samuel 9 verse 1, And David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Shaul that I might show him loving commitment because of Jonathan? So we see in verse 1 that King David wanted to fulfill his promises he made to his brother Jonathan. So I want to ask you, what promises have we made, my brother and sister, that we've not kept or that we are not keeping? I want to ask you, isn't it due time? Isn't it time we go back and we start fulfilling and honoring those promises? How often do we make promises to people or even to our Heavenly Father and we do not keep it? Again, isn't it time we go back to the beginning? Isn't it time we go back to that very same hour, that very same minute when we made those promises and start keeping them? Or can we ask today, have you and I ever asked the question, what can we do for the Father's kingdom? 
You know, when we read 2 Samuel 7, then King David asks, he asks Abba, he says, Abba, what can I do for your kingdom? What can I do for other people? You see, that's where it starts. It starts with the kingdom purposes. It starts with the bride. It starts with our neighbors. It's not about you and me. It starts with them. It starts with Mephibosheth. And David knew. You see, when we focus on the Father, then we focus on His people. When we do our Torah studies, my brother and sister, how many times have we said it? Father is all about community. When you and I focus on Him, then our focus are on His community automatically. When we want to serve our master, Yahushua, then we serve his community automatically. Are we available to serve? Are we servants in this kingdom of our Yahuwah? Are we ready to serve? That's all part of spiritual preparedness. Are we ready to serve? You see, because serving others... And serving the Father starts with love. Because He is love. Are we love? Do we serve? Verse 2 and 3 to Samuel, 2 Samuel 9, verse 2 and 3. And the house of Shaul had a servant whose name was Tiba, and they had called him to David, and the servant said to him, Are you Tiba? And he said, Your servant. And the sovereign said, Is this not still someone of the house of Shaul or Saul that I show him the loving commitment of Alua, the grace of the Father? In other words, and Tiba said to the sovereign, There he is still a son of Jonathan, lame in his feet. You see, David's actions is led by the heart of the Father. Because David says, Who can I show? Allah's grace. To whom in the house of Shaul that still left that I can show the loving commitment of Allah. You see, David knew it's not about him. It's about the restoration, my brother and sister. It's about the Father. It's about you and me being restored back to him. It's about Nephi both have been restored back to the table. It's not about you and me. To serve other people is not about you and me. To show grace, to show loving commitment, to show goodness to other people. It's not about you and me. It's about the Father. It's about His kingdom. It's about restoration back to the King. So in verse 3 we get to know the main character of this chapter. Mephibosheth. You see, Mephibosheth was the only living son of Jonathan and grandson of King Saul and the only one left of the house of Shaul. So what happened here and why was he lame? So Saul was the king over Israel. If we can quickly just catch up, Saul was the king of Israel. And in that time he was chosen by the father to be the first king over his people. You see, because they wanted to be like the rest of the nations around them. Israel wanted to be like the rest of the nations around them. They also wanted a physical king. They wanted a human to rule over them. And isn't this the same picture as Israel when they got to Mount Sinai in the desert? When they said, Moses, you go and speak to the Father. Moses, you go in here and then you come and tell us. Moses, you come and speak to us on behalf of the Father. You see, my brother and sister, that is where the problem starts with you and me. Because we do not press in to hear from the Father. Because you and I do not study His Word ourselves. Because you and I are too lazy to pray for ourselves. We would rather go and ask the pastor to pray for us. You and I do not need an earthly human king to rule over you and I, as my brother and sister. We need to search out our king of kings, our heavenly king, our master Yahushua. 
That's the one whom we should desire. So are we like that? Do we want a man to rule over us? Do we want to follow a man? Because that's what we do. When you and I follow man's opinions, when you and I go and ask the pastor what does he think, instead of asking our Father in heaven what does he think, then we are choosing man over our heavenly Father. Because we want to listen to man's opinion instead of hearing from our king himself. Is it because the commands of man or the instructions of man or the teachings of man is easier for you and me to follow? It suits our sinful nature. It suits our comfortable lifestyle. That's why we rather want a man to rule over us. That's why we rather want the opinion of men. You see, spiritual fitness and readiness is about hearing from the Father because He is spirit. And listening to man is flesh. And we know what the word teaches us. We've been reading it for the past two weeks. Anything of the flesh leads to death. So why was Methibosa flame? So King Saul decided to go into war with the Philistines. And he had his sons, oh sorry, and he and his sons died in this war with him. So some of the wartime tactics uh, in those days was for the conquering king to kill all the men and boys of the slain king's household so that they would not start a rebellion or some sort of resistance or revolution against the new king or the conquering king and his household. So the servant maid that was looking after Methibosheth at that time, who was five years old, knew this. She knew what would happen when Saul and Jonathan and them died in the war. And so she took Mephibosheth into arms and she started running. Because she didn't want him to be killed. And unfortunately, according to 2 Samuel 4 verse 4, he fell and therefore he was lame. And in this we start to see the heart of David, where David showed a great love towards uh, Saul. Even if Saul made himself an enemy of David, David went against the principles of revenge and against the principles of self-preservation and asked what could he do for the kingdom. David asked what could he do for this family. You see, because the father teaches us judgment, my brother and sister is not yours or mine, but his. So whatever people do against you and me, whatever they say, judgment is not yours, nor mine, it's the Father's. He is just. He is righteous. So we could say David did not want to destroy this household. David did not want to destroy the previous kingdom's household. He wanted to restore them. David wants to preserve life. We read in Mark 12, verse 30 to 31. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Lord, with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first command. And the second, like it, uh, like it is this. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. You shall love neighbor as yourself. And this includes your enemies, my brother and sister. You and I are not to judge over them. Our enemies are our neighbors and we are supposed to show love and commit grace towards them. So firstly, when we read this verse, David had no idea if there was a descendant of Saul or Jonathan still left or still living. You see, David had to ask around, and then the servant came, and he says, yes, Mephibosheth is, is still alive, but he's hiding. He's still there. You see, Mephibosheth feared for his life. The second thing of this verse that we should understand, David says he wants to show the kindness of Abba Yahuwah. He wants to show the, the, the grace of the Father. 
You see, it's important for us to understand the heart of David here. He, he wanted to show someone else the same kindness Abba showed him over the years. Is that what you and I do? Do we show towards our neighbors the same kindness the Father showed us? Are we giving love the same way Father gives towards us? We read in 2 Samuel 7 verse 8 to 9. And now say to my servant David, thus said Jehovah of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I've cut off all your enemies before you. And I've made you a great name, like the name of the great ones who are on the earth. You see, Father showed kindness and grace and commitment to David. So can we see the heart of David to give in the same manner as he received the same grace, the same kindness, the same commitment? You see, spiritual preparedness is not seeing yourself more important than, than others. This is a man that was a king and he did not seem more important than the Mephibosheth. You see, it's about knowing your place in the spiritual kingdom. What is our measuring tool? What is the measuring tool we use to measure people with? What is the measuring tool we use that we treat other people with? Is it the same as the Father showed towards me? Or do I look down on other people? Do I see them as inferior? This, my brother and sister, is important for us to understand. In this spiritual war that you and I, you and I are in, in this preparations that we are in, in this getting ready, this fitness we are in, how do we see our neighbors? Do we see ourselves as high and mighty? We should show the same full measure of grace and kindness and love that the Father showed us, we should show to others. Yeshua came to the earth to show us the grace and love, mercy, kindness, the goodness of the Father. And then he said, listen, he said, if you want me, if you, want, if you, if you, if you follow me, do the same. So are we doing the same? Thirdly, the servant tells David that there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. We first learn of Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 4 verse 4 and he tells us that the son of Jonathan was made lame in his feet from an accident when they, like I said, this maid heard that Jonathan and her soul died and they took him and they started and then she ran and he fell. So we get to introduce to Mephi both and say, listen, he is lame in his feet. In, in what we've read in 2 Samuel 9, before we hear his name, we hear that he's lame in his feet. Before we learn about the name of the son of Jonathan, we learn that he's lame in his feet. Isn't this how the world looks at you and me sometimes? Isn't this how the world perceive you and me? Isn't this how the world um, sees you and me? That we lame. You see, my brother and sister, how do you and I think the world sees you and me? Are we damaged goods? Does the world think we, I don't know, arrogant? Does the world think we are helpless or useless? Are we lame or paralyzed in the spirit even? We need to ask these questions today. We need to ask what is keeping us back from walking in purpose? What is keeping us back from being spiritually prepared and fit? Are we chained by the way the world looks at us? Are we chained by what the world says about us? We need to get free from that, my brother and sister. 
So what is lame? You can find the word lame 25 times in the Bible. But only three times the word is used as noke. I hope I pronounced it correctly. It's the Hebrew Strong's H5223. H5223. Noke. And it literally means lame in the physical, to be smitten, to be crippled. But it also means a sad and desperate state. In other words, to have a contrite heart, to be bruised in the spirit. So yes, physically it is to be lame, to be paralyzed, to be smitten. But it also means in the spirit to be bruised, to be lame in the spirit. So can we see that Narke is, is both spiritual lameness and emotional, uh, or sorry, it's both physical lameness and also emotional or spiritual lameness. Are, are, are we lame in the spirit, my brother and sister? We, we started talking a few weeks ago and we started with this uh, spiritual preparedness series. Are we spiritually prepared or are we spiritually lame? Isaiah 66 verse 1 to 2 we read, Thus said Yahuwah, The heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you built for me? And where is the place of my, of my rest? And all these my hand has made, and all these that exist, declares Yahweh. Yet to such, listen, yet to such a one I look on him who is poor and bruised of spirit, and who trembles at my word. Father looks at you and me today. Are we bruised in the spirit? Are we poor in the spirit? You see, it says, trembles at my word. In other words, it talks about obedience. To have reverence for the Father. You see, poor does not mean the opposite of wealthy. Poor is to know that with Abba Yahuwah, I am nothing. That is bruised in the spirit. To be lame in the spirit. To have a contrite and bruised heart. To be striked in the spirit. To have, been, to have this injury in the spirit, to, to, to have this, uh, this, like I said, this contrite heart before the Father. To know that He is my strength. So why was Matthew Boseth bruised in the spirit? So wouldn't you say that losing your father, your grandfather, losing your family and everything you owned, or even everything your family owned, like Matthew Boseth, don't you think that counts for being bruised in the spirit? Do you think Mephibosheth had any hope? Or any future? So can we ask today, my brother and sister, what are we hiding away? Whom are we hiding from? Do we feel we are lame in the spirit to do the Father's work? Do we feel that we are lame in the spirit to stand up for the Father? Do we feel that we are not worthy of anything that the Father wants to give us? Can we be honest before the Father today and confess that sometimes we do not walk in purpose? And can we confess that sometimes we are arrogant, we are prideful in the spirit, instead of being bruised, instead of being lame in the spirit, instead of having this contrite heart? Knowing that he is my strength. Can we be honest with ourselves today that we as children of Abba Yahuwah do not always walk in our full purpose? Because we do not understand the victory we have in the Father's name. Abba Yahuwah is faithful. That if we confess before Him our weaknesses, if we confess in truth that we need Him, that we are spiritually lame, then He will give us strength. He will lift us up. He will lead us to His table. And then, my brother and sister, He'll start equipping us. 
getting us ready, getting us fit. In other words, if we have a contrite heart before Him, a lame heart, then He will start to reveal to us His truth. And then we do not need to walk in the lies of the enemy. Then we do not need to conform to the enemy. Are you spiritually lame, my brother and sister? What spiritual injuries are we carrying around that we're not supposed to be carrying around, that we're supposed to be putting or laying down at His feet? Do we feel lost, neglected, or maybe not important? Do we feel that I have, uh, I don't know, I, I don't have a purpose? I have no reason for living? Today, Abba Yahuwah is calling you closer to intimacy. He's calling to you to His table. And from next week on, we're going to press in deeper. We're going to look at these promises. We're going to look at when David says, do not fear. What is that? Do not fear. I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to show you loving commitment. I'm going to restore to you your land. I'm going to, you're going to sit at my table and eat from my table. So let's press in this week, my brother and sister. Let's approach the king with a contrite heart. Let's not be spiritually arrogant. Let's not be spiritually prideful. Or to strive, but let's come with a contrite heart to the Father. Let's pray. Almighty and heavenly, Abba, Yahuwah, Daddy, who is a father like you? Abba, you call your sons and your daughters and you call us to intimacy. You call us to come and sit at your table. Father, you no longer want us to hang around in the courtyard. You want us to come in. To come into your presence, Father. You want us to come into the holy place. You want us to come further. You want us to, in intimacy, in fellowship, you want us to come into the holy of holies, Abba. To be panim al panim, face to face with you. To feel how you breathe over us. To, to hear your word. To feel your heartbeat. Abba Yahuwah, that is my prayer for your sons and daughters. And like I've said earlier, it's, it's not just to believe. In you, but to be intimate with you. It's not just to walk into a place and to feel your presence and your anointing, Father, but to have fellowship with you. That is my prayer, Abba Yahweh. Because you say you're standing at the door and you're knocking. And those that open the door, you'll enter and you'll fellowship with them. Therefore, Father, may your bride, may the believers, Father, hear your voice and open the door and have intimacy with you. To fellowship with you, my King. I praise you and I honor you and I pray all of this in your son Yahushua, our King and Messiah, in his mighty name. Receive this blessing from Abba Yahuwah. Yeverechecha Yahuwah v'yish merecha. Yair Yahuwah panavelecha v'chuneka. Yesa Yahuwah panavelecha v'yasem lecha shalom. Abba Yahuwah bless you and keep you, my brother and sister. Abba Yahuwah makes his face shine upon you and he'll be gracious to you. 
Yahuwah lifts up his countenance upon you and he will give you peace. Shalom, shalom. Have a blessed rest of your week. Shalom, guys.